Okay, that's one minute past five. I'm going to make a start. Um, folks, this is going to be really odd because there's five of you here. Um, but I am, normally I would just stop and have a chat, but um, we've got the live streaming. So there might be people at home watching it who are wanting more of a lecture. So I'm going to have to do it more as a lecture. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, were, were any of you here for the first run through on a week ago? No, no, because you were here for last Monday. Okay, I'm going to say exactly the same thing tonight that I said last Monday. So you may have a better thing to do with your hour at the moment than sit and listen to exactly the same lecture again. Okay, I will not be at all offended if you leave. I'll, even if it's just me in the room, I'm going to be standing up here talking for the next hour. Okay. Seriously, if, if, if you want to go, go. I won't, be, I won't be bothered. Right. Okay. What the session will cover. Was everybody here last week? All five of you? You weren't. Okay. So it could just be you and me. All right. <laughs> you, me, and everybody online. Um, what the session will cover, I'm going to talk about submission of your assignment, I'm going to talk about the assignment task, I'm going to talk about the assessment criteria, and there will be hopefully some time for questions at the end. Okay, um, so all these practical instructions are in the course handbook. There is nothing on the slide that is not already in your handbook, so this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Um, okay, the only thing to, to clarify is that Somebody emailed me and asked me where the um, draft submission drop box was. Because remember, you can submit a draft and, and check it against Turnitin and things. It, there isn't a draft submission drop box. There is just the one assignment drop box. What happens if you submit your assignment to it, um, you can then submit an edited version within 24 hours after that. Okay, so it's the same drop box. That means do not submit a draft assignment any closer than 24 hours till the final deadline. Because if you do, you won't be able to submit your real essay. And we will mark whatever is in the drop box at midday on Friday the 10th, okay? So if you are using it as a practice run for submissions, please make sure you don't do it any more than 24 hours before. Um, but as I say, everything else is, is um, in the handbook and the assignment submission drop box is now available. So that should be there. Yes? Originality score? Yes. Yes. When you yes. Okay. Is there a level that you can't get over? So no. There is no number. I'm going to chuck the mic back. There's no right number to get or not to get. It's all about how you are using it and whether or not the text that it's recognising as being from somewhere else has been appropriately referenced. Um, you could have 5% originality, but if that's all in one paragraph and it's all copied from somewhere and it's not cited at all, that could be academic misconduct. Whereas you could have 15%, you could have 20% and it's all been referenced, it's all, you know, we know exactly where it's come from and that wouldn't be. Okay? So there's no, I can't tell you a, a number to look out for that, that um, means you're in trouble or you're not. Okay? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the word count is 2,000 words, plus or minus 10%. Okay, so you can go as low as 1,800 or as high as 2,200. That does not include references. I also had an email from somebody asking if um, they should do a bibliography as well as references. The answer is no. All we want on the reference list is works that you have directly cited in the text. We don't want a separate list of, of text you've also read but haven't referred to. Okay, so the reference list is things that you've referred to in the text. The deadline is Friday the 10th at midday. Um, the feedback should be available by Monday the 4th of December at 5 o'clock. Um, I say should be, if there's, any, if there's going to be any delay to that, I will let you know. The one thing that might delay it is if we have a couple of tutors going off sick or something because we don't just mark the assignments, we mark it and moderate it. So every tutor's marking is then checked by somebody else to make sure that if I give somebody a C, it's the same as somebody else giving out a C. Um, and if, if people are off sick, then sometimes we can't get that moderation done in time. But I'm, at the moment, I'm expecting the marks uh, assessment to be back by Monday the 4th of December at the end of the day. Okay, we'll try our best to get it for you then. And I will let you know if it's going to be late. Um, if anybody needs to submit late or wants to request an extension, then you can do so using the course extension form um, as per the general postgraduate taught handbook. Okay, so we follow the regs. If you submit something late and you have not asked for an extension, then there is a late penalty. Okay, for every day that it's late. So watch out for that. 
Okay, so the assignment task, write a 2,000 word review of one of the journal papers. There's a choice of five journal, <laughs> journal articles you could look at. And you need to give a balanced evaluation of the paper. Okay, and by balanced I mean highlighting both the strengths and the limitations. All right. Now, people have emailed me and say, do I need to talk about the limitations? Can I talk about the strengths as well? Yes, that's what it says. It's both the strengths and the limitations. Um, something to point out, thanks to Malcolm Thorburn for highlighting this, this text of this used to say both the strengths and weaknesses until he pointed out that most peer-reviewed research doesn't actually have many weaknesses in it because it's been looked at by other academics and they've kind of gone, yeah, this is good enough to publish. So limitations is a much more appropriate term to use. And a limitation would be something like, well, you know, if they'd had a bit more money or if they'd had more time or if they'd had access to different um, participants, what might they have been able to do? So you're not necessarily, don't worry if you're reading the paper and you can't find weaknesses, think instead in terms of limitations. How could it have been done differently had there been more resources available, that kind of thing. Okay, more specifically, and with reference to the relevant literature, the relevant literature for this assignment is the methodological literature. It is not the content literature, okay? So if you are doing the Farrell and Ives paper on second language teaching, it is not the literature on second language teaching that you're supposed to be referring to in this assignment. It's the literature on research methods, paradigms, that kind of thing, okay? So make sure you're, you're referencing the right literature there. Discuss the articles. Now, there are four points that you are being asked to do. The first is to discuss the appropriateness of the research approach taken for the purpose of the research. I'm going to go over all of these in some detail. The second, the confidence we can have in the knowledge generated. Whether and if so how is potential impact addressed in the article? Whether the research is ethical? Okay, so you've got 2,000 words, plus or minus 10% to do all four of those. So let's go through them one at a time. Okay, first of all, you, you need to answer all four points. If you don't answer all four points, you're not going to get a good mark. So don't just forget to write about ethics or forget to write about validity or reliability, that kind of thing. A rough guide that we're giving you is to spend about 700 words each on part one and part two, and then 600 words together on three and four. So you're gonna spend less time talking about ethics and impact than you are talking about the research approach and the confidence we can have in the research. Now, 700, 700 and 600 obviously adds up to 2000, okay? So you are gonna to have to do an introduction and a conclusion as well. So you may well go over the 2000 words to do that, but yeah. So, so the fact that I haven't written, you know, 100 words introduction, 50 words conclusion, doesn't mean don't do it. I, I kind of ex assume that at master's level, you know that when you write an academic essay, you introduce it at the beginning and you conclude it at the end. Okay, so this is the first bit of the task. You need to discuss the appropriateness of the research approach taken for the purpose of the research. And a few folk have been emailing me and asking me about what do I mean by research approach? Well, it's in the handbook and it was in the course, but anyway, just in case. What I'm not talking about here, to be clear, is I am not talking about research approach, which some authors understand in terms of the kind of reasoning. So sometimes you'll find authors who talk about deductive, inductive and abductive research. Did that come up in any of your workshops? Was it in any of your core readings? Okay, so that's a pretty good clue that that's not what this is asking you about, okay? So as a general rule, what you're assessed on at the end of a course is what we've taught you in the course and through the core readings, okay? So when we talk about research approach here, we're talking about, in general terms, the approach to the research. What kind of position does it come from? Is this somebody or writers who are doing the research from a very kind of natural science background? What sorts of assumptions are they making about the kinds of things that research can do? Or are they coming at it from a much more interpretivist background where they're interested in developing understanding of something? What are the assumptions they're making about what it's possible to know? What assumptions are they making about how you can go about knowing that? Um, and the nature of reality. So that's your ontological, epistemological, and methodological assumptions. Um, and importantly, what you're being asked to do here is to identify the extent to which these implicit assumptions are compatible with the purpose of the research. Okay, so if somebody's setting out to do a piece of research where they're trying to identify a causal relationship, it would be very, very odd for them to do a case study or a basic interpretive research project where they're doing interviews. If you're looking for a causal relationship that immediately is seeing large scale, quantitative, probably a, a large survey or experimental design. So you're looking for the match between the purpose of the research and the assumptions, the methodological, uh, ontological, and epistemological assumptions that are being made. Is it a good fit? 
Okay? It would be quite surprising if something which was peer-reviewed was not a good fit. Yeah? So it's not, that, it's not that we've given you five papers where we think all of them are problematic and there's a real problem in the link between the purpose and the paradigmatic assumptions. What we're asking you to do is to draw out what those assumptions are and to say whether or not it's a good fit. It probably is. Okay? It probably is, so look for things that will allow you to make the argument that the, the kind of assumptions that the authors are making fit neatly with the purpose that, of their research. Okay? Sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper to find the purpose of the research. Sometimes it's not that explicit. That's probably a weakness of a paper, I would say, if it's not clear what it is that they're trying to do. Um, but you should be able to identify whether they're trying to um, explore something, are they describing something, are they trying to explain something, are they looking to understand, that kind of thing. Okay, a big part of the methodological approach is going to be the research design. Okay, so in this first section, you're also going to be talking about the research design. Now, in some of the papers, they will explicitly say, this is a case study, or this is an experimental design. And in others, they won't. Okay, so in others, you're going to have to do a bit more digging. One of the things to point out here is the third one I've got along here, basic qualitative. Now, if you remember the Merriam and Tisdall book, um, I've been reading for that and I think about week two or three, talks about the basic qualitative approach. Not every piece of research has to have a neat little label. Not everything is either a case study or an ethnography or a survey or an experiment. Sometimes it's just research. It's just qualitative research. Yeah? So some papers of the ones that you can choose maybe uh, fall into that group. Or it may be participatory research. It may be research that's working with people to do something. It may be action research. Um, okay, so when you're thinking about, when you're identifying the research design that the authors are using, you will want to think again about, well, what are the strengths and limitations of that research design? What do we know about experiments? What are they good for? What are they less good for? Okay, now you'll need to go to the methodological literature again. If you, if you choose to review an article that's a case study, you're going to have to find out a bit about case study and see what are the strengths of case study. And does that fit what these writers are using case study for? So all the way through, you're looking for this kind of golden thread, the strong connection between what the methodological literature is telling you about the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches to research and what the, the authors of the paper are trying to do. So the kinds of methodological issues, especially if you have a paper where it doesn't, is not clearly stating what the, what the research design is, you can think about research design as really being a, a kind of a way in which people answer um, methodological questions. Methodological questions are just questions about decisions you make about how you use your methods, who you use them with, how you select people, how you analyze the data, what your relationship to the data is, that kind of thing. So the sorts of things you should be thinking about, remember we're still in section one, is what methods are being used and why. Okay, and again, is this a good fit for what they're trying to do? How many participants? Is it a large-scale uh, piece of research or is it small-scale? And again, does that fit with the purpose of the article? Have they made sensible decisions? What kind of analysis is carried out? Are they doing statistical analysis looking for probabilities? Or are they doing a much more in-depth thematic analysis where they're trying to um, you know, get to the, kind of the essence of what's going on with people's understanding of something? And then what's the role of the researcher? Is there this idea of the researcher as being you know, somebody in a white coat that sits back and is very dis distant from what they're doing and isn't influencing the data and isn't influenced by the data? Or is it much more an understanding of the researcher as part of what's going on in the research project? And again, how does that fit with the kind of research they say they're doing? It would be very odd to have an experiment in which the researchers were talking about... Um, you know, their, their own experiences and being very reflective about stuff because actually that's not what we, that's not the way people normally carry out experimental research. Experimental research fits within natural sciences, fits within the positivist paradigm, this idea of the researcher as being very um, separate from the thing that's being researched and being very objective. So as soon as you get people talking um, subjectively about their own experience and their own values and things, then that would be a bit of a tension between that and a positivist piece of research. Okay? And vice versa as well, obviously. So it's quite odd if somebody's doing an ethnography or an autoethnography and, and um, in interpretive research, you'll find that people write about it differently. The style of writing is very different. Um, and often in research, which is more interpretivist or critical, it'll be the first person. You, the researcher will talk about themselves as I and how I felt about this and their own understanding. The more you get towards positivist research, the more likely you are to find it written in the third person. 
and no mention. There's no, it's not that there's a right way and a wrong way of doing it. It's just that that way of writing, that style of writing, maps on to what the person think it, thinks it is that they're doing. So it's very objective. It doesn't matter that it's me doing it. Anybody could have done this. Why would I put, my, why would I, put I into the article? Or at the other end of the continuum, you know, it's all about who the researcher is and this co-construction of knowledge. So who I am is really important. So I does go into that article. Okay, so that's one of the clues you can look for in trying to work out where the authors sit in terms of assumptions that they're making. Okay, and throughout this, you're thinking, how well do these, the answers to these questions fit with the purpose of the research? Okay. Um, the appropriateness of research approach, so this is just this continued, what ontological and epistemological assumptions can you identify? You are really, really lucky if you find an article where somebody says, I am an ontological realist and an epistemological relativist. They never tell you. <laughs> I'm a social constructionist. They don't tell you that. Right? It's not something that people flag up. And, well, actually, I was reading something today where, well, where they did say that. But generally speaking, it's not something that people state in a research article. If you go on to do PhDs, there'll be a whole section in your methods chapter where you position yourself within these different debates. But in research articles, you've only got 7,000 words. People generally don't do it. And that means you're going to have to try and work out what their position is, okay? What paradigm the research is located in. Um, and so that, and somebody emailed me and said, well, how can I tell if somebody's a social constructionist? Well, you need to go back to the article and you need to look at what kinds of knowledge do they think they're generating? What are they interested in people's experiences of things? If you're interested in somebody's experiences of things, that suggests you're more of a social constructionist because you want to know how that individual person or a group of people have made sense of something. Yeah? Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're more of a realist, you might measure something. You might try and get an objective measure rather than be interested in what somebody thought about what the measure might be. So there's kind of ontological and epistemological assumptions you might come across are, are uh, you know, assumptions that reality exists independently of the human mind, that it's, it's out there. Um, and it doesn't matter whether we're here or not, it's there. Um, that would be a realist um, ontology. Or reality is constructed, subjective, multiple, and relative. So if, if you've got a piece of research where people are talking about the ways in which different participants have understood the same thing, you know you're looking at something that's social constructionist. Yeah? They're not, you know, whether or not, they, they, may do, they may believe that there is a core experience behind that, in which case they're more of a relative, uh, more of a realist ontologically. Um, or they may just say though there are multiple realities and there isn't one truth. Um, the truth can be known through the application of the scientific method. Basically, if somebody is applying the scientific method, which is kind of shorthand for that kind of natural science-y type stuff, then you can be pretty confident that they, there's a good reason why they're doing it, because they believe that by, doing, by using that method, you're going to arrive at the truth. Yeah, why would you do that if you didn't think that was what you were doing? So that would be a sign, if somebody's using that approach, that they are probably more of an ontological um, realist, uh, more of a positivist or post-positivist. Multiple truths, all knowledge is subjective, findings are created, not discovered. And that, you know, that again would be something which is more social constructionist. You're more likely to be in the interpretivist paradigm if you're finding that kind of thing. Okay, so that's the end of, no, that's not the end of the first section. This is the end of the first section. So your job here is to infer, by infer, I mean, they are going to be there, obvious for you, all right? You've got to do some work. You have to infer what the paradigmatic assumptions are from the article. And you need to evaluate the strength of the relationship between the approach taken and the purpose of the research and these underlying assumptions. So how well does it all fit together? Is there anything that clashes? Now, as I've said, in most peer-reviewed paper, it does fit together reasonably well. So your job is going to have to be to evidence why you think it fits well. What, what evidence are you going to be able to take from the paper to say, well, this is what I think their paradigmatic assumptions are, and that fits because this is the kind of research that they've done. Okay, that's your job, is to pull that evidence together. It's not, you're not necessarily going to find big inconsistencies in these papers. You should use literature to support your argument. Okay? And, and the other thing to say is remember to say what key terms mean. It's a really good idea to define your key terms. And that's particularly the case with something like research methodology, where different writers use the same word to mean different things, or slightly different things. Okay, so as we've seen research approach, some people use research approach to talk about the kind of reasoning. Um, other people use it to talk about research design. Other people talk about research frame. So, yep, we were. No, so if, if, if I don't give you the mic, the people online won't be able to hear you. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think what you should do, just chuck it back, um, is when you're using words like interpretivism or positivism or paradigm, choose a definition that you like from the literature, one that makes sense to you and you want to use, and say, in using, you know, describing, just say what a paradigm is. There's, there's one of the definitions is it's an umbrella term and it's got these different things in it. I can't remember who that is. It might be Denzel and Lincoln. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So say, say whose definition of these key terms it is that you're using. And that will help the reader locate you where you are because they'll be looking at well that that's the reading that you've been done that's the literature that you're writing it one of the reasons i'm saying that is we've got about 400 students a few more than that on the course and you all come from different programs and it might be that some of you have been reading methodological literature and sports policy or in language teaching and it's important that the people marking it know if you're coming at it from a particular disciplinary perspective okay so so that we know um, where you're locating your, your stuff so yeah define key terms so Ontology, epistemology, methodology, paradigm, positivism, validity, generalizability, reliability, all those things. Tell us what you mean. Is that okay? Get the bloke in front of you to duck. Excuse me, I'm about to hit you with a mic. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you mean these ones here? Yes. Yeah. Those four ones. Uh -huh. There are more than nearly yeah. 1,000 words on this part. Yeah. Then should I write other things about, like, a thought of two models? Yeah, I mean, just think about what the key ideas in the course have been, and that's the kind of stuff you need to be putting in your essay. So if you haven't yet said anything about the ontological or epistemological assumptions, you need to go back and say a bit less about that and a bit more about them. There is a, you know, there's work to do in editing it down and just make sure that you're not repeating yourself and that it's written as succinctly as possible. But in the first section, yeah, we're asking you to identify the paradigmatic assumptions and whether that, you know, how, how that um, fits with the approach taken. Let's see what the, yeah, the appropriateness of the research approach taken for the purpose of the research. And what I'm saying is the research approach includes methodological, ontological and epistemological position. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's not an essay about it's not an essay about ontology and epistemology. And you're not asked to write two thousand words of ontology and epistemology. You're asked to identify the ontological and epistemological assumptions underpinning the the article. You don't have to go into a huge amount of depth about that, but you need to be able to say why you know what argument you're making about what you think assumptions the author has made. But you can't, you know, the, the research approach, you can't just answer those four methodological questions. Where are they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a bit of that answer, but it's not all of that answer. Okay. Right. So we've done that, haven't we? So, so yeah, to infer paradigmatic assumptions from the article, that's your job in the first bit. Do you want to chuck the mic back in case somebody else has got a question? Thank you. You're all being very good at not throwing it at me. Right. Okay. And again, the literature you use to support your argument is the methodological literature and define your key terms. Um, don't, don't over, you know, don't just have a sentence ontology means and then give a quote and a citation and then epistemology means. Try and kind of weave it into your argument a bit more. Use the literature to support your developing argument rather than, you know, just giving us a list of, of definitions. The second part, the confidence we can have in the knowledge generated, to what extent are the author's conclusions justified and why? Now, the, the way in which you're going to answer this is by looking at the stuff we did in week four. I think it was week four. The Graham Gibbs stuff. Was that week four? I think it was. Graham, yeah, thank you. And Miriam and Tisdall. Um, so, you need to, first of all, you're going to have to decide what the most appropriate criteria are to use to evaluate this article. 
So depending on the paradigm, the paradigmatic assumptions that are being made by the author, some of these criteria will be more or less relevant to your research. So remember things like validity, reliability and generalizability originated in the natural sciences. And then in the social science, social science started to develop. Some people said, we can research the social world in exactly the same way as we can research the, the physical world. And so those criteria for good research of validity, reliability, and generalizability should also apply to social science research. Okay, and that was kind of where we started about maybe 40 years ago. Since then, other people have come along and said, actually, it's not quite like that because, because um, these different kinds of research are founded on different assumptions about, about what there is, and so therefore what it means to say that something is true, it doesn't make sense to say that you know, we shouldn't really be looking for the reliability of something if we're not sure that there is a stable bit of knowledge, objective knowledge out there. That doesn't make sense to say, well, how can, we, how can we make sure that, you know, if I go and do an interview with somebody, they're going to tell me exactly the same thing as if you went and did an interview. And in science, scientific research in a laboratory, we would expect the results to be the same day after day after day after day, regardless of who was doing the measuring. It's not like that in a lot of social science research. Some social science research is like that, but a lot of social science research isn't like that because it's, it's based on a different understanding about what the nature of reality is and what it's possible to know. So in that case, in lots of social science research, people reject the idea that terms like reliability are appropriate ways to evaluate the research. So the first thing you need to do in the second section is you need to decide what the most appropriate criteria are to evaluate the article that you're going to take. I do not want to see social science research done in an interpretivist paradigm evaluated by criteria that were developed to evaluate positivist research. Okay, that would not be a good answer. All right. So. Some of these terms, I've also had emails from people saying, well, the word I want to use wasn't on your list. Is that okay? Well, yeah, that's fine. But you know, make sure you're, you're locating your, the criteria in the literature. There's lots and lots of different ways, that language that people use to talk about this, these different kinds of criteria. But it's depend, or dependability is there. Um, external validity, I think, was one that somebody said. I mean, external validity is just about the same as generalizability. So don't worry if the word terms you want to use are not there, but make sure the criteria that you're using to evaluate the paper makes sense for the kind of paper that it is and makes sense. These are not criteria made up in your head, but are criteria that you've taken from some of the methodological literature. Now, I don't care if you use Graham Gibbs's or you use Guba and Lincoln's or you use Merriman and Tisdale or you use, um, I can't remember, you know, some Longman, I think. You know, I don't care which set of criteria you use justify why those are the best criteria to evaluate the paper you've chosen, use the literature to back you up, and then evaluate it. Okay? So you, don't, you wouldn't be using all of these, right? because that would be silly, because transferability and generalizability are similar kinds of things applied to different kinds of research. Okay, in applying these criteria, you are likely to have observations to make about specific aspects of the research design. Remember when we looked at the paper about the cardiac surgery and the outcomes? And we divided into groups and people evaluated it according to how much confidence we could have. And folk found, well, there's some issues there with, with the lack of control between the experimental group and the control group. There was issues there about, well, how, how, to what extent is it possible to control other things that are happening around the group? How can you actually measure the amount of prayer? Those kinds of questions would be the right kind of questions to be asking of a similar kind of experimental type design. So you might be looking at the selection of participants. Remember, a good piece of experimental research will have participants randomly allocated to treatment and control groups, and, they will be, and everybody will be blind to which group you're in. That is the gold standard of experimental research. Very, very difficult to achieve in social science research, but that's certainly experimental research. If you want to be able to make strong claims that X caused Y, you ought to have randomized um, allocation into groups and they, you ought to be blind to those. Otherwise, you start having doubts about maybe bias has come in here. Maybe there's some difference between the groups, okay? The role of the researcher. To what extent has the researcher got their own position? Are they explicit about it? Are they clear about the way in which they've, they've um, acknowledged their own position and how that has influenced or not the way in which they've gone about doing their research. There's not a problem, in my opinion, with a researcher being deeply, deeply interested in and having a particular position in relation to the topic that they are researching. But if that is the case, then they need to be very careful to 
be able to persuade the reader that the story that they're telling about their data is actually the story of the data, that they're not cherry-picking quotes, for example. They're not allowing their bias to creep in. That you're so when I'm doing research on like, the experiences of young kids excluded from school, my position is usually on the side of the kids. I don't think schools are very nice places. Right? So it's very easy for me to do interviews with young people and only pick out the quotes in which they say school's horrible. Those teachers are mean to me. They keep telling me what to do and they don't listen. Right? So I need to be really careful that I actively go through all my data, seeking out bits of data which contradict my um, biases that I come to with the research. So if you are doing a piece of research and you've got a very strong position on it, there are ways, techniques that you can use and you can present to your audience to convince them that actually they should have confidence in this research story that you're telling. And that's what the second section of the paper is about. It's not about, well, that researcher was biased, therefore it's bad research. It's whether or not the researcher was aware of their bias and what steps did they take to keep that under check. So control, lack of control, control obviously applies to experimental design. Population, you know, who, what claims are being made to the wider population? How, um, how are, have people been selected from that wider population to do the research and what does that mean? So, for example, if you wanted to look at high school students' experience of, um, of the behaviour policy in their school, and you chose to do your research with a selection of participants, all of whom had been in trouble for their behavior, you're not going to be able to generalize that to the wider population of high school students because they're not typical. Okay, so what's the relationship between the people that the research is being done with and the wider population to which any claims are being made? There might not be any claims being made to transferability to a wider population. That's fine. If there aren't, that's fine. You can flag that up and say, well, that seems quite measured for them not to be doing that. And again, the methods and measures used. And there it's more about, well, um, you know, if, if I'm doing research onto happiness levels amongst students on sources of knowledge, how am I going to measure levels of happiness? It's a very abstract thing, isn't it? So what measure would I use and how confident could I be? So, so you could say, well, I'm going to measure happiness by how many people come up to me at the end of the lecture and tell me they're unhappy. And I could assume that if nobody told me they were unhappy, then everybody was happy. Now, clearly, that's a bit of a flawed measure. Yeah, there need to be other ways of measuring it. So how valid is the measure of the thing that you're, you're um, yeah, the, the measuring instrument that you're using? Okay, uh, moving on to the third section. Um, whether and if so, how is potential impact addressed in this article? You are not being asked to talk about the impact from the research. Okay, you are not being asked to say what impact can the findings have. What you're being asked to say is, what kind of research is this? Was the research designed to have impact? Remember, impact is the transfer of knowledge generated through research into the wider society. Is there an obvious user group for the, for the potential findings from this research project? And if it was that kind of research, what steps have the authors taken, if any, to try and involve those users in the research process? Now, there's a link on, I think it's, it might be week four as well, to the European Commission Horizon 2020 programme on responsible research and innovation which talks about researchers engaging with users and user groups right, from, right at the very beginning of their studies, getting involved with people, finding out what kind of questions practitioners have, getting some feedback from practitioners about the data collection methods or the sampling, that kind of thing. And the more you can have an engagement with the potential end users of your research, the more likely it is that your research is going to have impact and the more likely it is that it's going to be useful for them because they will have had some say in, in developing the research project. Um, if, if it's not the kind of research where there's obvious um, impact, potential impact, is that okay? Does all research have to have potential impact? Maybe not. That's something that you can argue using the literature. Okay? So it's not about what was the impact of the research. It's how was the issue of, a, in, of impact, potential impact addressed or not in the paper. And then finally on ethics, whether the research is ethical. Now remember there is more to doing ethical research than following the ethical codes. That's the, that's the easy bit getting the consent forms and filling in the ethical application. Okay? You need to think about was the research, were, any, were there any ethical issues in this research which weren't addressed? Or if there were ethical issues raised by this, how were they addressed? Go beyond the, well, you know, this study followed the ethical guidelines from Cardiff University. It doesn't tell you an awful lot about what they thought, uh, how much depth the thought the researchers had given to the ethical considerations or issues that the research might uh, raise. Okay, um, I want to say a bit, and this is kind of coming from uh, formative feedback tasks, really different levels of response. 
um, to show you the different ways that you can answer and why some are better than others. So you could just give an opinion, right? In this essay, I'm going to use reliability to assess the quality of the research in this paper because reliability is the right measure. Okay, not a great response. You might give evidence for your opinion. Okay, you might say, following Spender, 2013, so here the evidence is Spender. This is another author who's, who's made this argument already. I argue that reliability is. So you're, you're backing up your position. You're not just saying it's my opinion, but you're saying, look, other people think this as well. Even better, um, you can critically evaluate. And you can say something like, there's some dispute in the literature regarding the most appropriate criteria. For example, Spender argues something, while Saver argues something else. Um, I find Spencer's view more persuasive because. So what you're doing is you're flagging up that there are different differences of opinion in the literature, which there are, and you're reaching an informed judgment about which of them you find more convincing. That's critically engaging, critically evaluating. Okay, and that is what you should all be aiming to do at master's level. The first one is just describing. Okay, you will not get more than a, probably a D if you just describe. Okay, give evidence, you'll probably get a C. Okay, I'll say a bit about the grade marking uh, later on because it's quite different at Edinburgh. If you, if those of you who are new to Edinburgh marking will find it a bit scary. Um, okay, always give sources, even if you are paraphrasing, by which I mean putting a quote into your own words. Even if you're paraphrasing an author, make sure that you're attributing the ideas to them, that these are not your ideas, the ideas have come from them. Okay, if you're direct quoting, put in a page number. If you're paraphrasing, make sure you mention the author. Um, any work or ideas which are not attributed could see your work being referred for academic misconduct. It, and at master's level, um, academic misconduct is automatically treated as a major case and is automatically referred from the school to the college academic misconduct officer. You do get an opportunity to go and present your case and to say what's happened and whether or not you think you, you're guilty of academic misconduct, but it's not unusual for uh, marks to be deducted. Marks can be deducted to zero in severe cases, or you can have 30% reduction or 10% reduction. So it's a serious issue. There are some links here. That, that's what that URL is, how is good academic practice. One of the really important things is when you're taking notes, make sure that you don't just slip into that habit of just writing out what the person said, because then when you come back to read over your notes, how are you going to know what was your idea and what was their idea? So if you, when you're making notes, make sure you make, mark everything down as a quote if it's a quote. Okay? Um, avoid using too many direct quotes, because usually the suspicion is if there's lots of quotes there, it means you haven't understood it, because you're thinking, I can't possibly put this in better words or different words, so I'm not going to try. And, you know, so as soon as we see an essay with lots and lots of direct quotes, it raises suspicion that there's not a high level of understanding. It's certainly, it, it is not evidence that you have understood, and so we can only mark where there's evidence. Um, when you use direct quotes, make sure there's a lead-in statement to the quote and some discussion about it. Don't make the quote do all the work. Okay? Um, say why you're quoting it. Okay, feedback from the formative task. Plan your paper. Don't just sit down with a blank bit of paper or, or you know, blank screen and start at the beginning and finish at the end. Okay, one top tip. When I, I'm writing a paper at the moment, and what I tend to do is I tend to put in the section headings first, and then as I think of things that needs to go under each section, I, I write notes in, and then I kind of start fleshing it out into prose. What you can do is you can then take those subheadings away at the end before you submit the final paper if you don't like using subheadings. But it's, it's a good mechanism to use to help you structure your work in progress. It's absolutely fine to have subheadings in there in the finished document as well. Um, define your key concepts. Um, use paragraphs to structure your paper, one key point per paragraph, and each paragraph should have a key topic sentence that tells the reader what the main point of the paragraph is. I do not like reading paragraphs where it starts off saying one thing and halfway down we're onto something completely different because, because I'll be reading about 50 of these, well, actually more actually because I'm doing moderation, I'll probably be reading about 80 of them. So anything you can do to make it easy for me to follow your argument, please do it. Um, Present an argument. Don't simply describe or summarise. Take a position on something, and where there's a debate in the literature, say, um, explain which position you find most convincing. It's just what I was saying before. An opinion is not an argument. Saying what you think is not an argument. Saying what you think is great, but back it up. Okay, back it up either with evidence, or um, with sources, or with argument. Okay. So don't just say, this is what I think, and leave it at that. This is what I think because so-and-so says it, and they're really clever, 
or don't say that, um, or because it follows logically from something I've previously argued, that kind of thing. Use the appropriate academic tone. First person is fine, but use the appropriate academic tone. Don't make it too informal. So things like talk about children and young people, not kids. Okay. Right, I'm going to talk a bit about the assessment criteria. Uh, you, there are five assessment criteria. The four top ones are the general postgraduate assessment criteria with which you will become familiar over the next year. Um, we've added another one, achievement of the learning outcomes. So that's where you're going to find out specifically the learning outcomes of this course. And the way the marks are going to work is that you will be marked on each of the top, the first five of these out of 20. Okay, and then you will get a mark out of 100. But you will be able to see in your feedback what mark you've been given against each of these criteria. That's the first time we've done it like this, and the idea is that you will then be able to very easily identify what are the areas you're doing well in and what are the areas that you're doing less well in. Okay, so that's supposed to be helpful for your next assignment to think about things. What you will get is you will get your, your feedback back. There will be in-text comments, just like if somebody's using Word to make comments on your assignment as you go through. There will then be a kind of a grading sheet which will just have a letter and a number against each of these performance criteria, but there's already on learn a note of what a B at, you know, knowledge and use of the literature B, what that means, what that looks like. And you should also get back, you know, just a couple of sentences of audio feedback as well from your tutor. Now, this is the bit to pay attention to. The University of Edinburgh, 50 to 59% is good at master's level. Okay, now some of you will come from systems where anything under 70% is a poor mark. It's not. Okay, anything over 70% is excellent in the performance criteria talk about publishable quality. Groundbreaking in the discipline. It's one of the things for an A1, over 90%. When I was a master's student here, I was getting marks in the 50s. Um, and I got on, accepted onto the PhD and stuff. So that's, it's not a bad mark. So please do not get upset if you only get 55. 55 is a good mark, all right? And uh, you'll, yes, I know people don't believe me and you'll still get upset because you're used to, you're all bright people, that's why you're here, and so you'll be upset if you don't get anything. To, hardly anybody is going to get over 70, hardly anyone. Out of the class of about 400, my guess is there may be 10 or 15 of you will get that, that mark, okay? So just do the best you can, look at the assessment criteria, answer the question, and don't get upset if the mark is lower than you expect. Okay, the meeting, the learning outcomes. Demonstrate critical awareness of current debates concerning the purposes and interpretation of research. So that's all the stuff about social science research and natural science research and different purposes of research. Evaluate strengths and weaknesses of different research paradigms and philosophies with a reference to your own professional setting. Demonstrate understanding and skills in the analysis, evaluation, and interpretation of specific forms of social science research writing. And then the last one, issues of reliability. I didn't put all the criteria there, but you get the picture. Okay, that shouldn't come as any surprise. Partly it shouldn't come as any surprise because it's in the course handbook, but also that's what we've been teaching you for the last five weeks. There was some midterm evaluation where somebody said, we've not been taught how to collect data. Hmm, I wonder why that is. Because that's not what this course is about, okay? That's what your research planning um, uh, course is about later in the year. This course is not about data collection. That's why you've not been taught it. Uh, that's what you've been taught, so that's what you're being assessed on. Okay, um, I'm going to briefly talk through some of the performance criteria. I'm just going to do this for one of them because it's not that interesting and you can peruse it at your leisure later. Knowledge and understanding of the concept. So this would be an A, okay? You've understood the main concepts and theories dealt with in the course without any misunderstanding. You've got it all perfect. There's no misunderstanding. That's why it's hard to get an A, okay? I'm not sure I could get an A in this. I have to try really quite hard. And you've been able to integrate this into a coherent framework. So not only have you understood it without any misunderstanding, but you've presented this beautiful, articulate, fluent, coherent piece of writing about it. A B would be understood the main concepts and theories dealt with in the course still without any misunderstanding. So to get a B, there can't be any misunderstanding. And then a C, theories and concepts dealt with in the assignment reflect a major part of the course. You demonstrate understanding of these concepts. There is some misunderstanding. So at C level, you're allowed to not quite get it all, okay? So we're all C, I think. Uh, degree of understanding at the conceptual and theoretical level, some omissions or misunderstandings, that's a D. E, little or no evidence of understanding of the theories and concepts dealt with in the course, or the theories and concepts are handled in a way that shows considerable misunderstanding or omission. And that would be an E, so that would be a 30 to 40 mark. Okay. Um, 
This is a uh, full set of grade related, that's what I was saying earlier, full set of grade related criteria are available on Learn. Um, you will just get the letter against those, against those criteria and you will have to take that away and match that up to what that means. So if you get knowledge and understanding C, you'll go back and you'll look at that grid and you'll say, okay, what's the C for knowledge and understanding look like? And the reason for that is many people are teaching two workshops, so some people will be marking 45, 50 assignments and there is no point in me asking them to cut and paste those grade related criteria every time they're marking something. Um, that means that would slow down the process of getting the marks back to you. Okay, something to watch out for. A uh, word that often causes confusion is critical engagement. It does not mean being critical. <laughs> All right? It doesn't mean just criticising. That's not what critical engagement means. It means approaching everything with a questioning mind, asking questions, not, not taking anything on face value. Somebody says something, you think, oh, really, is that right? Hmm, wonder why they think that. What evidence have they provided for that? It's that questioning position. It's reasoning about it. It does not simply mean criticising. It's approaching things with a questioning mind. Okay. I wanted to very briefly, because I've only got about a few minutes left, to talk about Bloom's taxonomy, because I think this can be helpful in thinking about the kinds of things that we're asking you to do at master's level when we look at things like critical engagement. How many of you know Bloom's taxonomy from earlier courses? Great. Okay. So... Um, so, sorry, this may be a bit boring for you then. Um, but basically, Bloom's taxonomy is a, hi a hierarchy like this of cognitive um, skills, cognitive uh, behaviours, um, and knowledge is at the bottom. So when you're demonstrating your knowledge, and part of what you have to do is demonstrate knowledge, you're just demonstrating that you can remember what somebody told you. When you're demonstrating comprehension, that's showing that you understand. You're using that knowledge in such a way that demonstrates that you understand what they've told you. And that's the bit about not just using a direct quote, but being able to inter integrate the direct quote into your argument. Application, problem solving. How can you take those ideas and apply them to practice? Analysis, breaking things down into parts, making inferences, finding evidence. So you'll think back to what we were saying about the task. You're having to infer things. You're trying to find evidence to support arguments. Synthesis, putting it all back together in a new way, rebuilding it, but maybe in a, in a different way highlighting different things and evaluation presenting and defending opinions making judgments and using criteria so that's from Bloom's taxonomy and hopefully you should recognize most of these things that we're asking you to do in this task um, but I would say that the focus really is on comprehension analysis and evaluation for this task so the kinds of of questions which would be answered to demonstrate understanding would be which statements support um, what's the main idea of can you explain what's happening those are things, if you do them, you're demonstrating understanding. And these are some verbs to go along with comprehension. Comparing things, contrasting things, explaining, outlining, paraphrasing, summarizing, illustrating. That again goes back to the bit about the direct quote. We think when you, when you use a direct quote, it can sometimes be a sign that you haven't understood because you've not been able to paraphrase. To be able to summarize something, you do need to be able to pick out the most salient points the most meaningful points, the most important points. So that shows that you understand what's going on. Okay, a focus on analysis. So the kinds of questions that, that would demonstrate analytical thinking are what are the parts or features of something? What influence can you make? What's the relationship between different things here? Okay, so again, hopefully you can begin to see that we're talking about the relationship between the approach and the paradigm and the, the purpose of the research, where inference is about paradigmatic assumptions. And the kinds of verbs that you would associate with analysis are categorizing, classifying, discovering, distinguishing, simplifying relationships and inference. So if you're doing those things, you're demonstrating skills in analysis. Okay, that's good. We want skills in analysis. Focus on evaluation. What judgment would you make about it? How would you compare the ideas? That's the bit about taking two ideas from the literature where there's maybe a bit of dispute and kind of comparing them and seeing which you think is most convincing. Based on what you know, how would you do something? How would you evaluate something? How would you describe it? Why was one thing better than another? So again, evaluation verbs. Um, evaluate, judge, sorry, uh, yeah, evaluation verbs. Evaluate, judge, justify, rate, assess, interpret. So you can see that's a much more complicated level of thinking than just remembering what somebody's taught you. And that's what you're aiming for. Okay, comprehension, analysis, and evaluation in particular for this assignment. Okay, I've talked about the submission, the assignment, and the assessment criteria. Um, remember the full grade-related criteria are available on Learn. Familiarize yourself with them. Reflect on your formative feedback. Hopefully most of you took the opportunity to submit some formative feedback. 
But don't you'll have had formative feedback on other courses as well, not just sources of knowledge. Yeah. So the formative feedback that we try and give, we try and make it useful across all of your assignments. Don't think it's just the feedback you've had on sources of knowledge so far that you can use for the source of knowledge assignment. So if you're getting the same kinds of comments coming up about the way you structure sentences or your paragraphing or the need to be more critical, that applies to this assignment as well. Okay. There's some questions. I'll take any more questions from you guys, but some questions I've been um, emailed. Can I mention limitations of the author has already mentioned them? Yes, you can. Um, don't, you know, I wouldn't spend too much time talking about them. Try and go beyond what they've said. Can you cite websites? Yes, you can cite websites. I wouldn't recommend citing Wikipedia in a master's level assignment. Remember the first activity in sources of knowledge where we talked about how much confidence you can have in different sources of knowledge? You should be mindful of the sources that you are citing to support your argument. So the highest is kind of um, academic peer reviewed. Even textbooks are a lower level of confidence that we can have in them because textbooks haven't been peer reviewed. And government reports, even more dodgy, but certainly websites. Now, you know how to look for a website that is quite reputable. So something that has a .ac.uk in it, .ac.uk, is a British university website. There'll be other um, URLs for other universities globally. So you can think about who's doing the writing. But, but you know, the stuff you see on the web, anybody can have written it, pretty much. So be careful, be cautious. Um, should you read beyond the core reading? Yes. Okay, if you look at the assessment criteria for knowledge and use of the literature, you will not be able to get a B or an A for that assessment criteria if you do not go beyond the core reading. Now, you don't have to read everything that's on the core reading. Hopefully you've read it already. You don't have to cite everything that's on the core reading. You can use other reading to, to cite things. So don't feel, oh God, I've got to squeeze a reference to Merriam and Tisdall in here or to Waring or whatever. You don't have to do that but you do have to go beyond the core reading. You can reference the lectures if you want. Um, you just put the name of the lecturer, the date, the name of the, the title of the lecture, the course, and then University of Edinburgh. Um, I'd check, you, it depends which referencing system you're using. You might use APA or Chicago or um, Harvard, and they'll tell you how to, to lecture within that system. Uh, sorry, how to reference a lecture within that system. Can you use subheadings? Yes, um, I would. Um, can you use tables? This is an interesting question. I've never been asked this one before. Um, and I think somebody was thinking, well, they could use tables because that would help clarify their position. And, and like all the textbooks we've shown, you've got tables in them, haven't you? And my answer was, yeah, you can. There's nothing to say you can't, but just be careful because tables are often used to simplify things. And if what that's doing is it's allowing you to present a simplified version of what you think, you're not going to get credit for an in-depth understanding because you will have simplified it to be able to get it into the table. If you're using it as a starting point within your table or to match maybe bits of examples from the text, from an article that, that you think attribute it to an interpretivist paradigm, say, or a you know, relativist ontology, um, then as long as you're talking about that a bit more in the text around the table, I think that'd be fine. But I would be a bit cautious about just using a table because I think you might get yourself into a situation where you're oversimplifying things. Okay, certainly use tables as you're working on preparing the assignment to help you organize your ideas, absolutely. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Are there any questions from, oh, excellent. Sorry, it's in form, it's not gonna break, I promise. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, the, the knowledge and use of the literature, if all you're reciting is websites and you're doing kind of, you're, you're doing as cited by, then that suggests that you've not done an awful lot of reading of the academic literature. And so it's going to be difficult for you to score well to get a high mark in knowledge and use of the literature. About so like, a, as, so you're, you're citing something that's been cited by somebody else. Yes. Yeah, I mean... As a general rule, it's, it, sometimes you can't find the original source because it's out of print, okay? Uh, is there one you're thinking of in particular, a source you're thinking of in particular? Uh, no. it's, it's not great. I mean, I think if you can go, if you can find the original text, then that is better, certainly. And I would be concerned about an assignment which only had secondary sources and websites. 
because there, there are enough of the primary sources out there for you to use it. So, so I would either try and get hold of the primary source, you've got until Friday, and try and read that. And the other thing is sometimes people misquote folk. A number of times you'll find somebody cited and you'll look at it, wait a minute, that's not what they actually said. Right? So you need to watch out for that. Um, but also, you, you, if, if it's interesting enough to have been cited in a textbook or an article, it's probably interesting enough for you to go and have a wee read of it and see if there's anything else that can add to your understanding. So take the time between now and then to just see if you can find it. If you can't, the other thing to do would be to find a primary source which says the same sort of thing and use that. One or two secondary citations aren't going to be a problem. But if it's largely secondary, it is. OK, any other? Oh, sorry, more questions? OK. No, because this is the first year we've had this assignment. Really? Yeah, I changed it this year. Should have seen it last year. It was terrible. Can't say that out loud. Um, and this this year, what you're being asked to do actually relates to what you've been taught in class. In previous years, it didn't. It was not a good assignment last year. Um, so, so there's so there is no example of a student's work on any of these papers. Sorry. Graham Gibbs? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, in this video, he cited there are four key questions about the quality of the research. It's from a book called The Limitations of Social Research by, by Shipman. Shipman, yep. And there are reliability and uh, generalizability. Right? <laughs> so I used them in my paper, and then I watched the second video. It says, in qualitative research, mm. these two are not. Mm. But I used them and I think so why didn't you watch that second lecture in week four? Well, if you'd watched the second lecture where Gibbs says these aren't the criteria we'd use in qualitative research or interpretivist research in week four, you wouldn't have made that mistake in writing your assignment because you would already have seen it. But I can't reference I right. think, uh, sources that back up my, uh, that says reliability so you're finding sources which, which yeah, okay. If you, if, you can, if you can ground your argument why those criteria are appropriate for the article that you're critiquing in literature, and you can draw on other people who say that these are relevant criteria and that we should hold that kind of research to the same standards, then that's an argument you're free to make. And, and actually, if your marker disagrees with you, you're not going to get marked down because they disagree with you. You'll get marked down if you misunderstood something. But it's OK for you to have a completely different opinion about this to what I have or what your workshop tutor has. That's fine as long as you're constructing the argument and you're drawing on evidence. Is what? Though, well, some, some qualitative research or some interpretivist research, I think qualitative is better used to describe data, I think some interpretivist research does aim to make generalizable statements. And that's when you find people doing things like trying to get a representative sample, being very careful about how they select participants and wanting to be able to make claims to a wider population. So some qualitative research or interpretivist research using qualitative um, data is trying to make claims to generalizability. Other research in the same paradigm is not trying to make those claims, and it's much more common to talk about transferability. There are different kinds of generalizability as well. There's analytic generalizability and the statistical generalizability. And if you're interested in that, you should look at Robert Yin's book on case study method. So statistical generalizability is where we've looked at this sample, this representative sample. So statistically, it makes sense that we can generalize this to the wider population. Analytic generalizability is where you look at one situation in depth and you, there are some key themes that emerge from it and actually you look at how those themes sit with the existing literature and, you're, and they may or may not have something to say to the existing theories or literature on that topic and they may have an application to, to other cases within that population. So generalizability is quite a, I mean it's, it's a complicated term um, and I think that you're right, some interpretivist researchers do make claims to generalizability. Others are more cautious and talk about transferability. The other thing, if you're doing something on case studies, Michael Bassey, I think, talks about fuzzy generalizations. This idea that you can't generalize um, everything to the whole population, but you can say, well, you know, there's some things that I found here which actually are going to apply in other similar cases. 
And that's why in case study research you would argue that what we need to do is, is present a very full description of the case that we're studying so that you can tell whether the stuff that was found in that case is likely to be transferable or generalizable to another case. So you might, in your essay, you might want to have some kind of discussion about the terminology generalizability and transferability and, and how it's used by different authors and then what your position is on it. That would be a good answer to be able to do that. But there isn't a right answer. There's lots of answers, in my opinion. No, there's lots of different writers. I mean, you know, the, the, the whole point is we're trying to work out, can the thing that the researcher tells us they found, can we be confident that actually this is a robust, you know, rigorous, systematic piece of research? Can we have confidence in the findings? Now, the kinds of criteria that you would use to evaluate that will vary. Um, and you might talk about credibility and dependability, but there's, no, there's not a right list of criteria that I can give you that I can say, if you take these four points and you apply them to any bit of interpretivist research, then you will have assessed the quality of that research. All right, you, the, work, the job that you have to do is think about what are the criteria which are most relevant for the piece of research that you're reviewing, and that will be different for different kinds of research because it will be based on different underlying assumptions about what it's possible to know and what the researchers were trying to do. So if the researchers are not trying to reach an objective truth, it seems a little harsh to criticise them for not having robustly identified the objective truth, because that's, that's not the game they're in. It's like saying to an orange, you're a really bad apple. Right? It's not trying to be an apple, it's trying to be an orange. We should evaluate oranges according to how good an orange it is, right? not how good an apple is. So use the right kind of criteria to evaluate the research. Is anybody else? Oh, we can come back to you this time. Has anybody else got any questions? Yeah. Do you want to chuck the... We'll start at the back. Do you want to chuck it back? Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Look at the European Commission, Horizon 2020, Responsible Research and Innovation website. It's, well, it's on the course. It's on the, it's on the, the stuff of week four, I think, or maybe week three. It's, it's European Commission, Horizon 2020, Responsible Research and Innovation. Okay? My question is related to main questions in the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, so you, you, well, yes, I mean, so, so what you're doing is you're problematizing. It. You're saying there might be a problem here because, you know, it seems to me that if, if the volunteer was somebody different with a different background, the findings might be very different. And then, but then think, well, okay, so what does that mean? It means that there's maybe some bias being introduced, that there, there's, there's, you know, how transferable are the findings going to be? Um, there's a whole lot of issues about the relationship between the volunteer and the researchers, and I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so yeah, so absolutely. Um, I think you don't want to raise questions without answering them, though. Okay. So I think what you, you can you can highlight problems, and you can do that by saying, you know, imagine if it had been somebody else. But actually, just be wary of raising too many questions and not offering answers. Okay. And and, and actually, because you've only got two thousand words, it might be briefer just to give the answers, you know, and say, if this, rather than say what would have happened if it had been somebody else, you could say, if it had been somebody else, then the findings could have been very different. Yeah? So I should formulate a question and then mention something that an author refers to by question, something like that? Well, you, you could do that. I mean, but as I say, I think, I think if you're, you've only got 2,000 words, 
if you're, if you're writing, if you do it once, that's fine, but if you do that time and time again, you're, you're writing a question and then you're, then you're presenting an answer, and in the answer you're drawing on another author who maybe has issue, you know, suggests something about bias sampling or danger of working with volunteers or something, you, you might find yourself using up too many words. I'm just suggesting that, the, that you might want to cut out the raising the question bit and just saying, this could be a problem. Or following Gibbs 2013, you know, I, there are some weaknesses in this approach because it's possible that. Yeah. I'm just trying to save you words so you can fit it all in. Okay. Well, there's not one answer to that. That's the point. The different researchers will have different views about what counts, what reality is, what constitutes reality, and, and what it's possible to know and what it means to have truthful knowledge of it. Go back to the lectures on knowledge. Okay, go back to the lectures from week two and I think week three and go over them again. I mean, I can't give you another lecture on ontology and epistemology at the moment, but, but don't make the mistake of thinking there's one right, there's, there's one right answer. What you're trying to do is identify the assumptions that those writers are making, whether or not they're the same assumptions that you would make. Okay, everybody has their own position about whether or not the world is real, how real it is, whether it depends on us knowing it for it to be there. Um, so one of the clues, though, you said you have to start at the ontology and epistemology and move on to methodology. Don't, don't try and do this in a linear fashion. I would actually go to the methodology and look at the approach that they're taking and the question that they're asking, and that might give you some clues as to what kinds of things they think it's possible to know. Because nobody is going to ask a research question that they don't think they can get an answer to. So are they interested in people's perceptions? Or are they interested in, in getting some objective fact? Are they talking about objective knowledge and reliability and generalizability and sampling and representativeness? If they are, that's a pretty good clue that they're working within the positivist or the post-positivist paradigm. So try and work back from the methodology to identify what some of the assumptions are, and that will be in terms of what it is that the purpose of their research. Are they trying to explore people's understandings, or are they trying to identify something that exists out there independently of any one individual? I think, I, sorry, I think it's just a case of going back to the readings and going back to the lectures and, and, and just working at it. And it's not, the, there's not an easy answer. And I can't, I can't go through the five articles and say, that's relativist ontology and that's realist because that's not fair. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're using very strong terms there and in research we tend to, tend to like to hedge quite a bit. You're saying to prove um, and there's probably not one definitive right list of criteria to use. You need to select, you need to make an informed judgment about why you're selecting the criteria you are and then defend that choice. But there's not one right list of criteria to be using. But yes, you're using the literature to you can say, well, this is the kind of research it is. This is the paradigm that it's located in. This seems to be the understanding of knowledge and truth that, that underpins it. Therefore, it makes more sense to talk about issues of credibility and trustworthiness than it does to talk about reliability and validity, as Gibbs said in his lecture, da 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 Yeah, this is not appropriate for that kind of research. So yeah, you back up the literature to justify the choice of criteria that you use, but don't think there's a right list out there to use. There's not. Okay. There's a wrong list, but there's not a right list. Hi. Yeah, do you want to get the mic? It's more for the people on the live stream so they can hear what you ask. Quick question. I'm going to check this on Yep. You mentioned that we have to remember to allow the self assessment. Is that true? 
No, there's no self-assessment document this year. Um, there was a self-assessment document last year. What there is on the submission template is an opportunity for you to reflect on how you have built on the formative feedback that you got for your formative task. Is it still on the checklist area? Right, okay, so no self-assessment. All right, thank you. So, well, sorry, where did you find the reference to the checklist? Self-assessment checklist. All right, okay. I'll go and have a look at it tonight. And, oh yeah, yeah, no, thank you. So the template and the checklist. Yeah, yeah. There's something they've done in previous years where you're asked to grade your own assignment and everybody said they got a B. <laughs> it's like, it seemed like a fairly pointless exercise. So you don't have to do that. Okay, sorry, I will make sure that's taken off the checklist. Thank you. I mean, you would want to say why you found it appropriate. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, but yes, absolutely. If, 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 I mean, yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. So, so, so these are, these are peer-reviewed journal articles, so most of them are pretty good. So, so it's not about trying to find the mistake they've made, because most of them haven't made mistakes. You might find limitations, um, but, but absolutely, if, if you think they've done a pretty good job of what it is they set out to do, that's perfectly fine to say that, but just say that giving evidence why you think it is and drawing on the literature to do that. But don't feel you need to go and kind of invent problems with the article if there aren't any there. And is it okay to how I mean, I think what you need to do is, you, you, if you're, you know, if you're agreeing with the criteria that they've selected, then you would want your marker to be confident that you weren't just agreeing because that's all you'd read. Okay, so you might want to say something like, alternative criteria which they could have selected might have included X, Y, and Z. It seems appropriate that they have chosen not to include these because they are more relevant for a different kind of that kind of thing. So again, it's just it's just showing it's it's that art of showing that you know a bit more than you're actually focusing on. Otherwise, you know, you 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 can't get the credit for having made an informed decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? Okay. All right. Thanks. Anyone else? Mm-hmm. No, don't, don't, this, this is a revision slide, don't, you, you should select the criteria from all the learning and reading that you've done on the course to date, not just from my slides, right? So go back to the Graham Gibbs lecture, go back to the readings for that week, and look at the literature to see the kind of criteria that people suggest we should use to evaluate research. Now, some of them will have been on my slides, some of them might not have been, but don't, my slide was not a new bit of teaching, my slide was just a kind of a reminder. And how many should we And there's no right number. You need to choose, sorry, I need to be somewhere else at six. There is no right number. Sorry, I'm not trying to be difficult, but there isn't. You need to, sh you need to use all the criteria you need to to be able to make a judgment about the quality of the research. Uh, another question is about the key As, you, as you're writing through it, I don't want a separate list of definitions, but in writing about the paradigmatic assumptions, for example, you will say the paradigmatic assumptions, comma, by which I mean the views of reality taken by, you know, follow that. So you, you, inter, you, inter, sorry, you integrate it into your, into your writing. We don't have a separate list of definitions. But as you discuss the ideas, say what you mean by them. Okay, there's somebody over here? Yep. I think this will have to be the last one. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the literature support. What kind yep. of uh, methodological literature do we need to uh, involve in uh, our uh, like the, the methodological support? 
Okay, so the methodological literature would be the research methods textbooks, so things like the Merriman and Tisdall, um, the Co and Waring. Um, there's books by Gary Thomas, David Gray. Um, there is a reading list. There's an extended reading list in the course handbook, which gives links to that. But you also might want to look at some journals. So like there's a journal of qualitative research. Um, if you're doing stuff on case study, you might want to look up case study method. Um, you know, it's just, so when I say methodological literature, I just mean academic writing about research methods. So if you're, if you're evaluating a paper which takes an experimental design approach, you will want to look for literature on experimental design. No matter what kind of, uh, what the topic, the area. The... Exactly. So the literature you're looking at is the literature on research methods. It is not the literature on second language teaching, kayaking down the spay, being a young person in care, um, gendered feedback, or whatever the other one was. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. So about the, uh, so we need to figure out the autology and the epistemology of this article. Mm -hmm. So how can I put it? Can I say the technology of this article is the the love or or I just need to integrate this? Yeah, you would say, you know, uh, on reading this article, it would appear that the ontological position taken by the researchers is one which might be described as whatever we think it is realist, you know, or naive realism or, or critical realism or whatever, and then give a reference. Say, the reason, you know, the, the evidence for it being located in this paradigm is where the researchers talk about whatever. So you're, yeah, you're, you're giving an account of why you think it belongs in that paradigm. And you're using examples from the article to say that. Um, so do I need to put this ontology at first? No, I don't care what, no. I mean, you do it in the order that it makes sense for you to do it in. So do we need to say the ontological is global? Yeah, I mean, again, I would hedge a bit. I would say, from my reading of the paper, I think that the ontological position taken by these reader, by these authors is, okay, so don't make strong claims about it definitely being that, because you might be wrong, you know? <laughs> but so just say why you think, the important thing is to say why you think that. What is it that makes you think that it's a social constructionist approach that they're taking? Or what makes you think that they're realists or critical realists or... Don't, don't go into too much detail about the content of the article. So your marker will have read the article. We know what all the articles say, right? I've given them all crib sheets where I've given like a three-page summary of the article and key points to know. So you don't have to repeat the content. I'm trying to do as little of that as possible. Just say which article it is that you're talking about. But assume the person reading your essay has read the article. So, I mean, you can say, you know, this, is, this, this uses experimental design, that's fine. But you don't have to kind of talk in lots and lots of detail. Assume the person reading it. You don't only waste your word count describing the, the, the research. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying don't mention it at all. I mean, if, you, if you're trying to use a bit of the paper, a phrase in the paper, to justify why you think it belongs to a particular ontological position, then of course you're going to have to mention what it says in the paper. I'm just saying, don't use hundreds of words up telling us what the research is about. Okay? Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa! <laughs> it's all right. Thank you very much. Okay, good luck, folks. Oh, cite the article that we're reviewing. Um, no.